Are there any more unexpected costs? Reputation. Shameful reputation often arises from excessive consumption. Many a time, I have disappeared into the car too ashamed to face the neighbours following the previous night's indiscretion. Making sure I used different pubs and off licences to get my drink was calculated to prevent getting a bad reputation as a drinker. Of course, there is a specific subject of promiscuity that can tempt any individual, even those who consider they have the highest of moral standards. Unintentional sexual encounters and infidelity instill their own shame. Outcomes including sexually transmitted diseases, regrettable sex, separation or divorce and unwanted pregnancies. These offload dire misery too painful to elaborate on, other than to say they can impart a lifetime of regret. Calorie intake also escalates the more you drink, and perhaps less obvious are the additional calories acquired through kebabs or other fast food we seem compelled to devour after a night out. Rolling into work the following morning, hangover, creates further distress, nationally costing industry £2.2 billion more per year than illegal drugs. Can drinking interfere with my work? Back in 2001, alcohol-related absenteeism accounted for 20.4 million working days lost. In 2007, the Chartered Institute of Personnel Development stated 40% of employers consider alcohol misuse to be a major cause of absenteeism and poor productivity. Obvious interference with work stems from unreliability in terms of timekeeping. Performance is affected in terms of efficiency, effectiveness and increased errors. Decision making can suffer, resulting in poor judgment and failure to follow safety procedures. In-house behaviour and attitude impact other colleagues and customers limiting earning ability, promotion prospects and career progress. At its simplest level, failing to perform at full capacity or making inexcusable mistakes due to hangovers in an oversubscribed market, employment market will unquestionably inhibit sustained employment and advancement. What causes addiction? YouTube is flush with opinions on what causes addiction. Some religious folk talk about seeking contentment through instant gratification and by idolizing anything other than Jesus. Someone else claims all addictions have as a root cause a fear of emptiness, as one can experience when alone in a room with nothing to do. Another guy talks about addiction stemming from inadequacy in social bonding. In other words, substituting alcohol for meaningful human interaction. Some don't consider it to be an illness at all but a choice, simply opting to get drunk and forming a bad habit. Some folk group all addictive behaviours the same, whether to substances or activities, for example, tea, coffee, chocolate, mobile phones, porn, watches, sport, etc. Medical experts point to genetic predisposition and biochemical imbalances as the common denominator. Personally, I believe dependence, or hooked, addiction, alcoholism, if you prefer, is related to all these observations and more, part of what I call the less than comfortable human condition. Yet there is also the simultaneous catalyst of craving, which seems to stem from having a genetic predisposition. This would account for why being an excessive drinker doesn't automatically mean you are addicted. Of course, from the perspective of harm, either situation is just as bad, the only difference being Addiction makes it almost impossible to quit. Trust me, I speak from experience when I tell you. It isn't something you would choose to have if you had prior knowledge of what to expect. I should now like to widen the controversy even more by asking you to picture, if you will, an alcoholic. Perhaps like me, your first thought is of someone plagued by years of bad luck and financial ruin, sinking into an abyss of oblivion, bottle in hand, wasted on a park bench. I recall occasions when I've walked past such a tragedy, avoiding eye contact lest somehow it might rub off on me. After all, I was a double graduate of the University of Wales and professional. I wasn't like these down and outs and didn't want to catch their misfortune. Sadly, this perception is all too common and more akin to fiction than reality. 
That said, it might interest you to learn that three quarters of those affected are employed, talented and respectable sorts of all ages and backgrounds who certainly didn't choose to end up this way. These are the ones you hear a little of, holding down responsible jobs, struggling to maintain a facade of respectability. By way of clarification, I am only too aware of alcoholics in recovery that are also doctors, dentists, nurses, professors, anaesthetists, builders, plumbers, politicians, electricians, teachers, students, pilots, bank managers, famous and non-famous. Need I go on? The important revelation here is that the bulk of the alcoholic iceberg is hidden, camouflaged by the climate of social excess. Perhaps you may have noticed there's not a park bench in sight. Why is addiction so destructive? Alcoholics remind me of the scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, when King Arthur severs the knight's arm and he replies, "'Tis but a scratch, I've had worse." When the other is similarly amputated, the knight replies, "'Tis just a flesh wound." On removal of a leg, as he stumbles about, he professes to be invincible. Even after his second leg is severed and nothing remains but his torso and head, he still denies his predicament, claiming it, it's a draw. Amusing as this is, as far as denial is concerned, it mirrors exactly what happened to me and everyone else I know. It's always those who are addicted that are the last to accept their condition. Sadly, most never live to see a change. There is only one solution for addiction, and that is complete abstinence as craving constantly exacerbates lack of control. Once control is lost, overwhelming circumstantial evidence suggests it never returns. Staying free of alcohol was totally impossible for me on self-will alone. Like millions of similarly affected individuals, my only way out was to surrender to a 12-step program as practiced by Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't think it would be appropriate to talk about their program here, other than to say if you decide you need to stop drinking, contact their national helpline. All I would say is that, had it not been for AA and a willingness to do what was suggested, I would be dead. Nevertheless, that alcoholism is a serious disease isn't something new. It was recognised way back in the Book of Books, Solomon's Proverbs to be precise, which describes their plight, adding, but still they rise in the morning and seek it yet again. In 1785, Benjamin Rush, the signatory to the Declaration of Independence, now acclaimed founder of psychiatry in America, also wrote about the illness. The alcoholic, he warned, would inevitably fall into melancholy, madness and despair and end up in jail or swinging from a gallows. Even Queen, Queen Victoria's doctor once reported that a very large number of people in society are dying day by day, poisoned by alcoholic drinks. He added, I hardly know of any more powerful source of disease. That alcohol is all compelling can, can be seen in the fact that prohibition was the first amendment of the American Constitution to be repealed. Nobody should take alcohol with a pinch of salt unless it's tequila. So why should you? Isn't alcoholism self-inflicted? In one sense, alcoholism is self-inflicted in that nobody pours a drink down our throats or holds a gun to our heads. Yet it is more to do with our genetic code and drinking habits than luck. In its own right, alcoholism is a progressive illness classified by the US medical fraternity and World Health Organization along with cancer, heart disease and diabetes. Chronic in nature, it unmercifully inflicts physical, mental and social damage on all in its wake. Controversially, most individuals addicted aren't even aware of it, due to the potentially extended phase where people function without serious side effects. Denial that anything is untoward is characteristic, further reinforced by shame and the disgrace that such a title bestows. Understandably, who in their right mind would be eager to accept such a label? So those afflicted, in the main, persist as functioning alcoholics, managing to stay afloat below the radar, so to speak, until one or other disaster forces tough questions. I know addiction is categorised as having three stages of progression, mild, moderate and severe, but to me, addiction is simple, 
You can either control intake or you can't. You can either stop and stay stop or you can't. It's like saying someone's a little bit pregnant. In any event, if you're hooked, it's only going one way unless you do something significant to counteract it. Don't let the abundance culture mask or otherwise disguise addiction. I promise you, it will end in tears and not just for you. Whatever recent statistics claim regarding estimates of alcohol dependence in the UK, these, in my opinion, grossly underestimate the extent of the problem. One fundamental flaw derives from the collection of raw data in that, as a nation, we're just not open, honest and upfront enough about how much we consume, or our drinking habits in general. Indeed, this very criticism is raised by the Office for National Statistics in their bulletin, released on the 1st of May 2018. It seems this one aspect of our lives we prefer to remain secretive about. Therefore, I am going to attempt controversy further by suggesting anyone currently drinking to excess on a regular basis may already be hooked. I know at this point you may feel like switching off at such a bold statement, but experience tells me anyone quick to defend their drinking may already be in denial, a serious, albeit non-official, symptom of addiction. Therefore, I suspect the condition in its mild to moderate state already exists in the one in four who regularly drink to excess. Assuming that to be the worst case scenario, a best case estimate would be one in 16, roughly a quarter. This is indeed far more serious than the published figures of one in a hundred of the adult population. In any event, you can't include the proportion of the population who don't drink. That only waters the statistics down. When considering the prevalence of addiction, you should only look at the overall number of people who drink, then express it as a ratio or percentage of that whole. It's nonsense to incorporate non-drinkers in that calculation because you're not doing a direct comparison of like for like. Oh dear, I expect the establishment will love me for pointing out deficiencies in the collection, presentation and interpretation of statistics. So be it. I've never been one for sweeping unsightly irritations under the carpet, especially when lives are at stake without a cure. Can I prevent problems occurring? The first thing we need to be aware of is the nature of the human condition. To be alive is to be constantly feeling something. Much of what we feel, however, justifiably or not, is discomfort. For some it's probably more accurately described as pain, the pain of life. This state of feeling can be the result of personal circumstances, external or worldly circumstances, how we fit in or a mixture of all three. Furthermore, this feeling can also fluctuate in severity and intensity, appear and disappear to any degree, any number of times in any given day. By way of contrast, alcohol induces an almost instant change in one's mood, which just happens to be more desirable than what I have just described. Therefore, the motive of displacing mental discomfort with a more desirable state of mind is natural and fundamentally a major motivator for drinking. Many enjoy a drink, and then we have the one in four that enjoy a lot of it. In the latter case, the reference to enjoy effectively means a preference for being in a pseudo-reality. This is because some aspect or aspects of their lives are less than satisfactory, thereby creating internal discomfort. Increased consumption leads to increased tolerance and craving, coming to bear and trapping the drinker in a progressive cycle of excess, and for those suitably programmed, into addiction. So, addiction can be explained in part by having a genetic predisposition to craving, and actively through the consumption of alcohol. I found a brilliant explanation that very accurately describes what happened to me and every other alcoholic I know. It's taken from a book called Staying Sober, A Guide for Relapse Prevention by Gorski and Miller, 1986, and it describes the three progressive stages into full-blown alcoholism. Firstly, the body develops a tolerance to alcohol. This means more can be taken without apparent drunkenness. This early warning is often considered as being able to handle one's liquor. In my case, it generated pride in being able to drink people under the table. Progressively, physical and mental dependence occurs and, although undetected, transforms a desire to drink into needing and seeking it to alleviate discomfort 
and other symptoms of withdrawal. Again for me, this manifested in feeling jubilant and relieved. The drink was never far away from the beginning, middle or end of anything I did. Problems may begin to surface in relation to marriage, relationships, legal matters, work and health, although these are usually written off or associated with causes other than the alcohol. In my opinion, these first two stages probably exist already in the one in four who currently drink to excess, although a significant proportion will also be experiencing the third stage. In the chronic stage, stage three, mood swings are common as drinking to relieve cravings fails to deliver and so to oblivion. Focus on maintaining one's supply intensifies as does avoidance of any interference in what has now become an obsession. Everything else is relegated to second place, which for me included my career, the very thing I needed to ensure payment of my supply. The downward spiral proceeds until permanent damage occurs. What's important is that this process will occur in anyone with a predisposition to craving, irrespective of any perceived reasons for drinking. In other words, it just happens if you drink. Bingo. That describes my experience exactly. What's sad about this account is the ignorance surrounding cause and effect. No one ever informed me of the inherent dangers of alcohol, apart from the Home Office emphasis on drink driving. Awareness generally within the population is still in its infancy, despite an explosion and overload of facts and information flooding the internet. What would help is a bridge of understanding between the two. Signs and symptoms of addiction just aren't brought to the attention of a drinker until it's too late. Even now, most victims end up in programs that advocate control drinking or harm minimization as a way forward, but these measures are essentially ineffective, certainly over prolonged periods. The fact is, the only solution for an inability to control intake is total abstinence. Any other approach equates to horseshit and an establishment cop-out period. In fact, the time has come to think prevention before intervention, before treatment. I'm only drinking more to ease a difficult situation. There is a common theme within some agencies that by addressing underlying emotional scars or current stresses, thereafter you should be able to resume responsible drinking. Whilst this is certainly desirable and has some plausibility, it is unlikely to apply to anyone with a predisposition to craving. In my experience, this is why brief intervention is often ineffective. At best, it imparts false hope for those suffering. It is true, a significant proportion of people use alcohol to temporarily escape the discomfort of life, and whilst these reasons can be convincing, they may not be appropriate or relevant. If addicted, a person doesn't revert to responsible drinking on resolving any issues of concern. I desperately sought to identify why I drank to excess, questioning whether it was due to stress, divorce, a tough childhood, because it was raining, because it was sunny, and so on. The reality is, I drank because of all these reasons, essentially to alleviate discomfort. However, at some stage I lost the ability to control how much I drank. Indeed, it is, a, it is this lack of control that baffles those suffering and many who work in the field. I tried everything to limit my drinking, but it was impossible. This has been the same for everyone I know. I now realise it's due to this phenomenon of craving. This is the crux of the matter, the real problem, undermining at some indeterminate point one's ability to manage or apply control. Furthermore, it exists independent of any perceived reasons. In other words, a person could be totally content with themselves and life, but still alcoholic, because it's the compulsion of craving that drives addiction. The fact is, if control were possible for addicts, a resolution would be straightforward, and therefore wouldn't be the devastating problem that it is. Societal misunderstanding and current appetite for excess are especially dangerous, as it ignores genetics. This means a substantial time bomb is waiting to take effect on a significant proportion of emerging generations. There has been extensive research that implicates an inherited predisposition to alcoholism, particularly where a family history exists. I find this fascinating because my granddad had it and both our circumstances were identical. 
I have no doubt my addiction stemmed genetically from him via my father, although Dad never drank, preventing its manifestation. Research on genetically identical twins has also confirmed its presence in both, not so with non-identical twins. So there's little doubt in my mind, alcoholism has less to do with luck, personal issues or irresponsible behaviour, and more to do with our inherited genetic code and amount we consume. If, however, this only applied to, say, one family in a thousand, then the odds of addiction kicking in wouldn't be that bad. From everyone I speak to, it certainly seems far more common than that. Do you know anyone in your circle who's drinking to excess, despite obvious concerns? Look at it from another perspective. One in five children live with a parent who drinks excessively. That's 2.5 million innocent victims, excluding the drinker. Is that acceptable in the 21st century? How can we claim to be a caring society? if we turn a blind eye to such an alarming and damaging fact, especially as they are four times more likely to become alcoholics themselves. Surely, the focus needs to switch to prevention rather than treatment. What should I consider? I want to finish off by declaring once again that alcohol is obviously no ordinary commodity. It is inherently pleasurable and without doubt an appealing drug primarily for its mind-altering characteristics. However, I have been blessed surviving dire consequences of excess and addiction, hopefully so you don't have to. Indeed, my experience very much reminds me of the Hans Christian Andersen fable of the Emperor's new clothes. You may recall, the Emperor is fooled into buying an invisible suit that could only be seen by wise people. Of course, all are afraid to criticise or point out the truth because everyone else seems to think it's wonderful. That is, apart from one innocent child who sees it for what it is. To me, drinking to have a good time is the lie, the invisible suit. That's the biggest con of all. What does it say about us as individuals or as a society that we can't enjoy ourselves without imbibing to excess a potent, cancerous, drug. It's true, during my drinking days I could never understand anyone that didn't drink, but now I can see how irresponsible that was, and how I had been brainwashed into drinking without caution. With hindsight I realise alcohol was an instant escape from myself, but sadly it came at a price. Finding an internal acceptance of me, the world about me and how I fit in, has resulted in a peace of mind and a contentment that has no need for drug-induced stimulation. It's such a tragedy that society isn't geared up to achieve this for its other masses. Take heart because I am happy to outline measures that work for me. In practical terms, I'm particularly fond of what Michael Caine, Sir Michael Caine, says regarding substances. In reply to an interview question, he said, I look for examples of people who do things. If I saw someone who became more intelligent, nicer, more handsome, a better physique, earned more money, became a better lover and a better example, I'd be the first to follow suit. Most people I have observed have gone to rack and ruin it, or I don't want to go there. I'm also reassured by Del Boy in Only Fools and Horses, when he turns to Rodney drinking along, alone in the nag's head, and says, You won't find any answers in the bottom of a glass. This is particularly relevant if you're drinking for inappropriate use. Should this be the case, it would be far better to look within and deal with whatever is causing discontent. Indeed, if one is drinking to be sociable, I would suggest there is no need to drink excessively, as excess is simply indicative of escape from inner conflict. Sadly, I have learned from painful experience, alcohol only adds to this burden. So the British guideline has been introduced for a very good reason, to steer the drinker away from harm whilst remaining sociable. Yet, many have been quick to condemn this move, in defence of their right to get drunk. They claim the nanny state is seeking to limit their freedom. Ironically, couldn't be further from the truth. It's the alcohol that limits freedom, especially if you're the one in four who drinks to excess. So I urge you to do yourself a favour and be proud to be British. Stand up for British values that, generates, that generations fought and died for. Say good morning to your neighbour. Offer a helping hand to the elderly and infirm. Enjoy your Sunday roast and if you choose to drink, Become part of the cultural change and do so with the British guideline. 
Let all British values shine brightly as an example to the rest of the world and have a better time in the process. When looked at objectively, we each have a responsibility to keep our drinking in check, to prevent it from having an adverse effect on our lives, our loved ones and those around us. We each have the privilege to take stock and by using real as 100% proof measures, the opportunity to intervene should circumstances prove unacceptable. The time has come to project internationally a positive image of the British drinking culture. To that end, digest all that has been brought to your attention, remembering that small measures can bring about changes in terms of risk and how we go about enjoying our precious lives. Why allow your future to be dictated by loaded dice or even genetics? Make positive changes now, because who knows, you may never get a second chance. How did Alan get to prefer life without alcohol? The following account is based on my own journey of recovery over many years. However, like every journey, it started with the first step, and then the next, and so on, one day at a time. The application of new ways of thinking continued to deliver a state of mind that is both peaceful and content, so I choose to implement this approach every day, but especially today. This is because yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, and today's a gift. That's why it's called the present. Adopting new ways of thinking happened because I didn't want to suffer relapse, yet I discovered many benefits that are also available to anyone, alcoholic or not. After all, even wealthy people commit suicide through not having peace of mind. It's probably fair to say when alcoholics attempt to get sober, they are at their worst ebb. I certainly was. What I mean is, in addition to poor physical health, most have a great deal of excess psychological baggage, including guilt, resentment, self-pity, an overinflated sense of self-importance, or the opposite, intolerance and a shortage of patience. They can also be selfish, egotistical and manipulative. Yes, that was me. It doesn't take a scientist to figure out that a life with so many character defects isn't going to be much of a joy. No wonder we drank. Non-alcoholics may be more adjusted, but there, there's always some attitude or other that can be improved on. Oh dear, I just dropped a bombshell. Yes, I'm afraid to say this has to be done by yourself. Unfortunately, it can't be obtained via a prescription tablets or a surrogate. The first thing I did was to make an agreement with myself to be fully open and honest. I was my own best friend and worst enemy, so it was time to call a truce and make a trusting and lasting pact. I then stood at the threshold of a new beginning, which required kindness and an understanding of myself. At no point from then on was I to internalise harshness, criticism or judgement. I now had a loving friend that I could confide in, who would be with me right to the end. It helped knowing I wasn't seeking perfection, only doing my best to develop well-being for a satisfying life. Then I asked myself, what sort of a person did I want to be? For whatever time I have left on this planet, would I rather be searching constantly for something to fix me, or just be at peace? For the purposes of contentment, I put to one side temporarily material success and professional status. I just needed to focus on me as a basic, stripped back to the bones human being. It helped to keep foremost in mind that whilst it may be nice to be important, it's more important to be nice. Having a rough idea of how I wanted to evolve, it was time to look at my most glaring character defects that stood in my way or weren't serving me well. From the offset, it was obvious I was full of resentment and self-pity. It was irrespective whether I could justify those emotions or not, as they only guaranteed internal distress. I had to banish them from festering rent-free in my head. The easiest way I found to achieve this was to substitute thoughts of gratitude and acceptance. In practice, I felt grateful for all the good things life had given me, and I surrendered to accepting everything outside of my control. Just for today, I try to do my best in any given situation, satisfied that this is all that is required. I am not responsible for outcomes, only for doing my part, for the right reasons and motives. Next, I understood that anger is a perfectly normal emotion, 
but one that needs to be vented in appropriate ways. I learned to convert frustrations and anger into disposable energy through sport. Thus it became a constructive driving force. Impatience proved very difficult to resolve, and I'm still being given plenty of opportunities to practice. Intolerance of others is similarly tested, but I believe the effort is worth the while. Anything I have no control over is just the way it's meant to be at this precise moment. If I can't have what I want, whether that's material, actions or situations, I just accept it. And of course, I'm always pleased for the successes of others. It really is pointless fretting and getting irritated by anything I cannot change. I find relief in simply turning all those situations over to a higher power. Okay, at this point I hear some of you cringe. Listen, for those of you comfortable in a religion, carry on believing. If you are basically sceptical about there being a God like I was, why not consider the following proposition, <clears throat> as I did, excuse me. I assumed I could at will summon up the best of the world's scientists, geneticists, physicists, mathematicians, construction specialists, banks, with unlimited access to funds for free, not to mention unlimited time, tea and biscuits. All I had to do was arrange for them to be at Wembley Stadium all on the same day. Having satisfied myself I hadn't forgotten anyone important, I opened an envelope and read out loud the following task. You are required to build another planet similar to this one. You have all the world's resources to hand and as much time as you need. I imagined whether that could be done. Of course I realised it would be a waste of time. Therefore if man couldn't create a planet, who or what could? Whatever it was, as far as I'm concerned, is a higher power. At times when I struggle with life, I simply turn to that higher power and humbly ask for guidance and strength to see it through. I highly recommend it. Lastly, thanks to a well-known 12-step recovery program, I realise that all difficulties present in some way, shape or form, as either people, places or things. A number of simple slogans have helped me tremendously in coming to terms with these. I will now state them for you to use at will. Easy does it. Try not to overload or make unrealistic expectations of yourself. Keep it simple. There's no advantage in overcomplicating life more than it already is. Live and let live. We all are different and there is room for us all as well as our opinions. There, by the grace of God, we tend to forget most of our lives are beyond our control. First things first. For recovering alcoholics, this of course refers to staying sober. Let go and let God. Just do what you can and leave him to decide the outcome. How important is it anyway? Is the issue that's bothering you life-threatening? I know counselling can be beneficial in removing mental blockages. However, whatever took place in the past remains in the past. Knowing the cause of distress doesn't automatically make it disappear. We still have to come to terms with it and move forward. This requires healing through changing outlook. Obviously, a clear conscience is an essential foundation for building a better future. To achieve this, in some cases, especially for alcoholics, making amends are especially important. I had to, in order to clear away wreckage from my past. Likewise, at any time in the future, if I sense I have wronged someone, it's important to quickly apologise and attempt to put things right. In so doing, I avoid taking on new torment. Eventually, by applying all these changes, I began to feel better, which was preferable. Then I would lose the feeling and wonder what had gone wrong. It became obvious. Contentment requires continual practice. I often have to look at myself and ask, what am I not applying? Over time, I have proved that peace of mind is inversely proportional to the application of altered attitudes, but rewards are well worth it. 
the outcome has been truly priceless, which I would not exchange for all the money in the world. Of course life still happens, but by using these tools, I am able to take life in my stride. Speaking of money, power and status, they now take their position in descending order of importance, but not so much for how they benefit me as how they benefit others. As for alcohol, well, I just don't have use for it anymore.